This is amazing. We finally know the official launch date for Starship Flight 11, and it's even sooner than anyone expected. The reveal came just when the U.S. Coast Guard issued a local notice to mariners in Boca Chica, Texas, tied to the launch window. Now let's dive into today's episode of Alpha Tech and see if you guessed the launch date right. Just like with every other Starship flight, the U.S. Coast Guard usually puts out a local notice to Mariners, or LNM, before the FAA issues its notum. Not always strictly first, but most of the time. The Coast Guard gets a jump on things, working with SpaceX on preliminary schedules, since fishing boats out at sea move slowly and sometimes take a full week just to get back to shore. Just yesterday, the Coast Guard dropped the latest LNM, and the space community went buzzing. The notice, number 28909, warns about upcoming launch operations from Pad A at Starbase. It comes with a detailed map showing a wide exclusion zone in the Gulf of Mexico, marked in blue, stretching straight from Boca Chica's launch site. This is the area where debris from the Super Heavy Booster, or its hot staging ring, could fall after stage separation, or where the booster itself might land. Since this is a reused booster, SpaceX isn't aiming for Mechazilla this time. Most importantly, the LNM has officially suggested the launch window for Starship Flight 11, October 6th through October 12th. Each day's window runs from 11.15 p.m. to 1.22 a.m. UTC the following day. For anyone watching in U.S. Central Time, that works out to a 6.15 p.m. start, a prime slot to catch both liftoff and the all-important landing attempts right after work. The schedule has been carefully planned to maximize visibility and ensure the collection of as much data as possible. The earliest possible liftoff is October 6th, which means the rocket definitely won't fly before that date. And the remaining days in the window, through October 12th, serve as backup opportunities in case of any last-minute adjustments, weather issues, or technical delays. This is a strong signal that SpaceX is accelerating its launch turnaround. If liftoff happens on the 6th, that would set a new record of just 41 days between flights, counting from Flight 10 back in August. And that's despite the setbacks, like the issues at Massey's test site and the need to repeatedly install and remove adapters on the orbital launch mount just to pull off the upper stage's static fire. Without those hiccups, the record might have been even better. So, now while we wait on the FAA to issue a NOTAM locking down airspace and formally approving the launch, it looks very likely that sometime next week we'll see Ship 38 and Booster 15 roll out to the pad. Personally, I'm still betting on October 8th for the launch. What about you? Drop your guess in the comments below. Back at Starbase, around 1 a.m. on September 24th, Ship 38 was rolled into Mega Bay 2 after its full static fire and returned from Pad 1. It stayed right by the doors, and about an hour later, the workers closed up shop, so no one really knows what went on inside. Most likely, it just sat there overnight, giving engineers easy access to check the ship. The engines, fresh off that intense static fire, were the top priority, each one carefully inspected to make sure nothing got damaged and everything's ready for the next flight. Then came the heat shields, the real heroes of re-entry. These plates have to survive crazy heat, vibrations, and pressure, and Ship 38 has a more complete setup than the prototypes before, with big upgrades like the crunch wrap design. Engineers went over every inch to see if it can survive the harsh ride back through the atmosphere and to spot any risks that need fixing. Other systems weren't left out. Cargo bays, fuel tanks, composite overwrapped pressure vessels, aft flaps, fuel lines, all got a thorough once over. Past lessons are clear. Whatever went wrong before Flight 10 can't happen again. Once those inspections wrap up, SpaceX will slot in the payload integration system, hook up the flight termination system, and add a batch of Starlink satellites. Then, Ship 38 will be all set for a smooth rollout to the pad. Still at the bay, Super Heavy Booster 15 is looking better than ever. The hot staging setup is already complete, and it may even have its own flight termination system installed. Basically, that means it's ready to roll out to the launch pad at a moment's notice. Outside Mega Bay 2, crews kept grinding through the night, finishing the foundations of the new Gigabay. Soon, that massive building will completely block any direct view into Mega Bay 2. Kinda sad for us space fans, but hey, it's the trade-off we have to accept for faster launch and production cycles, especially with all the rapid test flights happening these days. Now, let's shift over to the Massey test site, which has been partially back in action since early September, 
following repairs from the Ship 36 explosion back in June. With those fixes in place, adjustments can be carried out much faster. Cryogenic tests for V3 tanks like 18.3 ran here from September 16th to 20th, showing the site is ready to fully support operations. After that, the tank shells will be installed on the OLM along with other refurbishment work. SpaceX estimates it will take about a week to get the launch mount fully operational again for the mission. All of this underscores one clear fact. The next Starship flight is very close. Flight 11 isn't about setting records or racing the clock, it's about success. And that success will kick off what SpaceX calls the V3 era, a critical phase where the company has to hit new milestones to prepare for future missions to the Moon and Mars. Back on the V3 front over the past few weeks, there are clear signs that SpaceX is finishing up the first two vehicles of Starship version 3, Booster 18, and Ship 39. Let's start with Booster 18. On September 19th, observers spotted the aft section being moved from the Star Factory into MB1. Take a good look. This is the very first the three aft section we've seen, complete with the fuel transfer tube SpaceX revealed a few months back. It won't be long before the first V3 booster is fully assembled, and honestly, the wait is getting exciting. As for Ship 39, things have been quieter. The most recent update goes back to late August, when a rover cam outside caught a bridge crane stacking Ship 39's nose cone onto the payload bay section. The nose cone already has a substantial number of ceramic heat shield tiles installed. Realistically, we'll likely have to wait until October for more concrete updates. Ship 39 will probably have to wait until the Massey site finishes its cryo-testing area to run its initial tests, which could fall toward late October or early November. And as mentioned, Massey is progressing really well. With the site coming online, SpaceX has finally put an end to all the OLM modifications at the launch pad that were previously required just to test Starship's upper stage. With Massey fully operational, these tests can now run much more smoothly. Those are the latest updates from SpaceX. On the NASA side, things are moving along nicely with the Artemis II mission. Mission managers shared on September 23rd at the agency's Johnson Space Center that Artemis II, a 10-day mission taking four astronauts on a loop around the moon aboard NASA's Orion spacecraft, could launch as early as February 5th, 2026, with the latest possible launch date in April 2026. NASA officials noted that if the mission does take off in February, the launch window would likely fall during nighttime hours. Still, Lakiesha Hawkins, NASA's Deputy Administrator for Exploration Systems Development, emphasized that crew safety will ultimately dictate the timeline. Hawkins said, We want to stress that safety is our top priority, she added. So as we move through operational preparations and after the rocket is fully assembled, we continue to evaluate every step to make sure everything is done safely. The reason NASA is confident about this early schedule is that the Space Launch System rocket for Artemis II is already stacked and declared flight ready. Meanwhile, the Orion spacecraft is in its final preparations and is set to be mounted on top of the rocket later this year. Early next year, the combined stack will be transported to the launch site at Kennedy Space Center. Once on the pad, the rocket and spacecraft will be hooked up to ground systems, and about two weeks later, they'll run a wet dress rehearsal test. During this fueling exercise, both the first and second stages of the rocket will be loaded with liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen, and the countdown will be brought down to T-29 seconds. After the test, the rocket will be drained and returned to its normal launch position. Because of Earth and Moon orbital alignments, plus other mission constraints, each month only offers a launch window of about four to eight days. After liftoff, Orion will separate from the SLS upper stage just over three hours into flight. It will spend roughly 24 hours in Earth orbit, during which the four astronauts on board will run a series of checks to ensure life support systems, thrusters, and other spacecraft systems are fully operational. If all goes smoothly, Orion will perform a main engine burn to send it on a free return trajectory around the moon. On this path, the spacecraft will travel roughly 8,000 to 14,000 kilometers beyond the moon before heading back to Earth, designed so that it can complete the mission even if the propulsion system encounters any issues. After completing its moon missions, SpaceX will shift focus toward the next frontier, missions to Mars and beyond. 
Scientists today are increasingly looking at exploring asteroids and the outer solar system using nuclear-powered rockets. The idea is simple. Use the energy from a fission reaction in liquid uranium to heat the propellant and generate thrust. The technology they're exploring, called the Centrifugal Nuclear Thermal Rocket, or CNTR, is particularly exciting. Its potential can be summed up by its specific impulse, essentially a measure of how efficiently a rocket produces thrust. In theory, CNTR could double the specific impulse of earlier nuclear thermal rocket designs from the 1950s, which are still under study by NASA and DARPA, and deliver roughly four times the efficiency of conventional chemical rockets. Even though no nuclear-powered rocket has ever flown, space agencies around the world are increasingly seeing nuclear propulsion as the key to faster interplanetary travel. The reasoning is simple. The longer we stay in space, the more health risks astronauts face. So anything that can cut that travel time is a huge win. Traditional nuclear thermal rockets use solid uranium fuel to heat liquid hydrogen until it expands through a nozzle at high velocity, generating thrust. The CNTR takes it a step further. It uses liquid uranium in a spinning cylinder, hence the centrifugal name, maximizing fission reactions and boosting engine efficiency like never before. In theory, CNTR technology could take spacecraft farther, using less fuel, making fast missions between Earth and the Moon possible, or even enabling crewed round trips to Mars in just 420 days, instead of the two and a half to three years it takes with chemical rockets. Hydrogen doesn't necessarily have to be the only type of fuel. A variety of materials could be used, some of which might be extracted from asteroids, comets, and Kuiper Belt objects along the way once again enabling missions to travel extremely long distances. The hope is that SpaceX will get involved and successfully apply this technology, bringing Musk's Mars dreams closer to reality than ever before.